think. Twenty minutes, twenty-five minutes. So I'd like to uh, introduce Armand Chalik, who is coming to us from University of Texas at Austin. I believe he's got some additional introductory material in his presentation, so I won't take that away. Uh, he'll be uh, talking for about 25 minutes, so if you could save the questions until he's complete, and then hopefully we'll have a nice, robust discussion. Come on. Thank you. <coughs> well, uh, <coughs> thank you very much for inviting me to uh, make a presentation. Um, I'm going to probably spend too much time in this chart, and it's not because I'm trying to impress you with my background. I just want to make some points. Okay, one point I would like to make is that uh, uh, I come from the Aerospace Engineering Department. Uh, I've never had a systems engineering course in my life. Um, but I recognize from my experience, which has been mostly in industry, that you cannot design, I'm, I'm an airplane designer, and you can't de design an airplane unless you really understand systems engineering. And uh, you can't design an airplane if your engineers don't understand systems engineering, at least not very well. And so I'm a firm believer in the fact that every aerospace engineer needs to understand systems engineering. I, I, I cannot believe that they can work competently in today's environment if they don't. And so I think it's really important. Uh, and so I teach, uh, I, I teach one of the uh, capstone courses in aerospace. So we have two. One is space and the other is aircraft. And uh, we have been teaching systems engineering as an integrated part of our design courses for not quite 10 years. And so this is an industry, so you know, Mr. Miles has some experience in the, in the aerospace industry, and it's been based on the principles of systems engineering for decades. And yet, you know, one of the leading aerospace programs uh, in, the, in the country, only in the last 10 years, is actually teaching something about systems engineering. Just think about that for a minute. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing I would like to point out is uh, from the introductions, it's fairly clear that most of you have uh, are, are fall into the category of what I would what I would call uh, systems engineering as a discipline. Maybe that's not what your backgrounds have been, but most of you are teaching something related to systems engineering, and it's called systems engineering. And so this is a little bit dangerous for me because I might tick some of you off in, in some of the observations I'm about to make. But I think we all share the same goal, and the goal is. Every engineer needs to understand systems engineering, and so what's the best way to accomplish it? Now, uh, <coughs> I've, I'm a lifelong member of uh, the AIAA, so Aero <coughs> uh, Association uh, for uh, <coughs> Air <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, I was going for a lifelong member, so I, yeah, okay. <laughs> so in any event, uh, but I'm a relatively new member of INCOSE. As a matter of fact, uh, in less than five years, so I still have to pay full rate. Uh, <clears throat> and I belong to a lot of other associations, okay? Um, and so here's my, <coughs> the, the, let me kind of go to the top of the list. So like a lot of people in my generation, I, you know, I went off to one of the military services because you had to. And so I went through a program called Military Methods of Instruction. Anybody who's been in the military knows what it is. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them, tell them what you told them. So now I want to tell you what I'm going to tell you, what, <coughs> what I plan to tell you. And that is uh, teaching systems engineering to all engineers is a very doable thing. It, it truly is. But in order to do that, the mix in this room, and, and this is, again, this is why I stand a chance of taking you off and I don't intend to, there needs to be a lot more representatives from the disciplines that are teaching, that are the target of this program, than there currently are. And so I believe uh, one colleague from mechanical engineering, right. And so there need to be a lot more of us in the audience in order for this to be uh, <coughs> to be effective. And not only do we need to be in the audience as participants, we need to be in the audience as leaders for our own disciplines. Because unless we're willing to step up and can step up to lead 
introduction of systems engineering or discipline, I don't think we're going to be successful. So I think that's, a, that's an important element. Now let me press on. So here's uh, <coughs> my definition of uh, systems engineering for all engineers, and it's focused on undergraduates. Uh, that's the only chance we get to get all engineers before they go off to do their engineering. Some of them we can catch at a graduate program, but the fo my focus is on undergraduates. Uh, <coughs> the important part of systems engineering that I think they all need to understand are the fundamentals. And by fundamentals, I mean fundamental principles. Um, do, do they have to know the meaning of all the acronyms? No. Do they need to understand the concepts? Yes. Um, I think it needs to focus on very, very practical application. Uh, if uh, systems engineering is a lecture course with concepts, they may remember it to the end of the semester, particularly if to take an exam, but it's gone the next. So practical application is really important, and that's why hands-on is important. Okay, so a little bit of background. You've already heard some of it. A <coughs> uh, long time ago, I <coughs> was asked to write an article for Aerospace America, which is the AIAA monthly publication, and it was on future technologies for fighters. And so the expectation was I was going to talk about all the glories of aerodynamics and propulsion and structures and all of that sort of stuff and in areas for breakthrough. And, to, and so the article was about... Uh, <coughs> the breakthrough is going to be an integration, not the individual developments of the disciplines themselves, but how they integrate into a product. And kind of the good news is, well, that was exactly what happened. And the bad news is that uh, <coughs> some 20 years later, I had to stand <coughs> uh, in front of my colleagues at an AIAA meeting and talk about, you know, you obviously didn't read this, you don't, you know, the importance of integrating our product. We actually know the importance of really superbly integrated product. Problem is, all these engineers are coming to me out of academia, and they don't know anything, but they've never heard of the subject. They don't know anything about it, and it puts the responsibility on me as an employer to have to teach it to them, and that's just not the way it's supposed to be. I mean, we're not talking about how to run a code. We're not talking about tasks. We're talking about fundamental understanding of principles, engineering principles. And it's not, it's not coming out. And so uh, I went off to teach at the University of Texas. So you know what kind of approach I took to teaching aircraft design. And then the kind of the good news is I hooked up with a fellow by the name of Hans Mark, who uh, <coughs> used to be the uh, DDRNE, the Deputy Director of Research and Engineering in DOD, and a high-level official in NASA. And all. So Hans is, uh, is pretty well known. And so he and I got together and, and we shared the very much the same view, that we really need to teach our students how to put aerospace products together. And if they don't learn it, we're failing. And so he, uh, he arranged to uh, <coughs> uh, extended some invitations to uh, uh, <coughs> colleagues at uh, what was then called DDRNE, now ASDRNE, and so uh, we got a visit. Um, Mr. Welby came, uh, Mr. Lemnios came, and it gave us a chance to talk about why we think it's important that aerospace engineers all really get a good solid education in, in uh, systems engineering. And the point <coughs> we're trying to make is that uh, you know, why should, why should the Department of Defense be even slightly interested in this? And that is because we think, and it was my analysis of the data, was that a lot of the cost overruns and the failures associated with aerospace programs directly related to uh, what are called systems engineering failures. All their medial action was focused on people called systems engineers, and most of the screw-ups were coming from the other engineers. And so that it was clear that there needed to be a program, there needed to be a focus on teaching systems engineer, engineering to engineers, the people that were probably causing most of the problem. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so we succeeded in convincing them that uh, to sponsor a program to develop a, a pilot course, a pilot program to do this. And so one of the first questions you might ask is, well, why wasn't that done through the CERC? Well, the answer is real simple. University of Texas at Austin, which is 
the kind of the main campus of the University of Texas doesn't have an undergraduate program or even a graduate program in systems engineering. So we're not eligible to be members of, of uh, CERC, at least we weren't then. And, uh, <coughs> you know, we had other campuses that have very good systems engineering programs, um, but, you know, we were the flagship campus and we weren't teaching systems engineering. And so, uh, <coughs> anyway, we got, uh, we got some support and uh, the support <coughs> allowed us to develop a two-semester course. Previously, the aircraft design course was one semester. Two-semester course that consists of these two pieces right here. And so the first part of it is kind of, I'm, I won't say it's the traditional approach to aircraft design, but it's mostly focused on, you know, learning the design process, which students need to learn. I don't care what their discipline is. Their homework problems don't automatically prepare them to do design. And so they need to learn how you approach design. So that gets, goes on. And so it's a, it's a lot of a theory of design. And there is one, a grand total of one lecture on something called systems engineering with a handout. Now that one lecture and the handout pretty <coughs> it comes across as pretty important because it's got at the end typical exam questions. They get exams and so they know they're going to get tested on it. So that helps them a little bit. But uh, <coughs> it is not what you would call, what many of you as systems engineers say, a very systems engineering intensive uh, curriculum if all you did was just look at the, you know, what, what's, what's in the syllabus. But what's in the syllabus is the practical application of systems engineering and everything that goes on in that semester and everything that goes on in the second semester. And it starts off with some structure. And so the structure actually has a, a systems engineering content to it, and I'll show you that in a minute. And then a very, very systems engineering structured program in the second semester where they actually have to go out and uh, build, test, and demonstrate and validate their product works. So uh, this is, a, this is a, you know, one of the breakout sessions is going to be on what do engineers need to know about systems engineering. And so this is my list from a number of years ago. And it's, it's been, it started off as, uh, I think, 13 or 14, and now it's up to 16. And it consists of kind of two pieces. So there's a dozen that <coughs> are the focus. Every, as far as I'm concerned, every student, aerospace graduate, needs to understand these subjects. Right? Then there's a thing called leadership. And there are two kinds of leadership. One of them is personal leadership. You know, can you stand up, defend, and rational and explain your own work? That's personal leadership. And then can you lead a team? So we break that up into two pieces. Uh, everybody needs to demonstrate personal, learn personal leadership. And some, some students are more interested in becoming program managers, project engineers, and so they gra gravitate towards team leadership, and that's fine. And those that gravitate towards that, we teach them some additional things that are specifically focused on uh, team leadership. Anyway, so that's, that's our definition. Um, top two uh, requirements. No, number one, number two. It's like, you know, what do you, <coughs> how do you take the requirements and, 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 and turn them into something that the team can design to? And then, how do, you, uh, how do you track those requirements and manage them? So it's broken up that way. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our lessons learned on that and, and how it worked, rather than spend a lot of time in individual items. Yes, sir. Sir? What is the background of the students before they uh, Background of students is the, they typically come into the design course in the second semester of their junior year. So they've had most, they've had not all of their basic aerospace coursework, but they've had all of their basic engineering coursework. Okay, so this is what happens in the first semester and, and uh, uh, the only reason I'm showing you this is to tell you that, show you that the product that they're designing is a very, very complex system. It's a uh, semi-autonomous unmanned air vehicle. It is flown off laptops. It's got a camera. It's got two uplinks and two downlinks. Uh, <coughs> They have to, uh, so it's got cameras, it's got autopilots, it's got sensors, and they have to, do, they have to build a model of the design before, as they are designing it. So it's model-based design. Okay, um, and so it may look like, well, that's not, <coughs> it, it starts off with a, 
an off-the-shelf radio control airplane. And the reason they do that is I have a very small lab. It's much smaller than this room, and it's used by a couple hundred students. And so we don't have a lot of space for them to build things that, uh, <coughs> and, and leave them there. And so what happens is they start off by, uh, their, their first semester project is to go through and evaluate radio control model airplanes and, and go through an evaluation process and model them and do a selection of which one they're they want us to go buy. And uh, there's multiple teams that are <coughs> uh, participating in this, and then this is a competitive activity. Like uh, this semester, I have, uh, I have 20 students in class. And they're, uh, they submitted their proposals for the next semester, and we're going to do a down select to one of those proposals, and all the teach students are going to end up in one large 20-student team next semester. Okay? And so what they do is they take that off-the-shelf airplane, and then they redesign it to, meet their mi to optimize it for their mission requirements. Okay, and so this, is, uh, this whole process is controlled by a fairly, I won't say a standard, but from a perspective of a, somebody who spent their career in industry, that's just like an RFP with a appended contract. <clears throat> and so the first part of it is the R request for information or request for proposal, and then the second part is what, we, what the expectations are for execution. And so it, 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 the second part focuses on uh, detailed design, build, test, fly, <coughs> um, and, and flight test and validate a model. Okay, so a lot goes on in that second semester. And uh, it's about a 50-page document. It has a lot of shells, but most of the shells are not about, there are some shells about what the product shall do. You know, it has to fly for 45 minutes. It has to do a search, surveillance and deliver a taco to a, a target, which they have to precisely target. But most of the shells are associated with process. You, know, you shall <coughs> conduct before flight, we conduct a flight readiness review, and you, sh you shall conduct, you shall uh, meet the entry criteria. Okay? And so um, <coughs> what the students have to do is uh, <coughs> is not just read that, that requirement document to determine uh, what that product should do. It's their responsibility to, outside of the top level require, uh, the top level mission, figure out exactly how they're going to have to do it. And so they have to design the mission and the vehicle and the camera and the installation all together. So they're responsible for developing their own concept of operations. And, uh, and iterating the concept of operations with the product they're designing. Um, <clears throat> and so this is how, uh, this is focused on the second semester. The first semester is a, uh, a little bit like this. You can't read it, so I'll just tell you what some of these things are. Um, <clears throat> is uh, the, the systems engineering approach is really a, is, uh, embedded in the basic structure of the course. So there's almost nothing in the course that doesn't follow a, uh, a, 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 a systems engineering approach. And so we do lots and lots of reviews. And I'll show you a, a typical review. And so some of these things will start looking familiar to you. Ah, it looks like a product development plan. Oh, there's a thing called a preliminary design review and some, something called a, a detailed design review and a critical design review and test readiness. And so the systems engineering is built into how it is we uh, <coughs> not only structure the student's assignment, but how, we, uh, how they get their grades. And so that tends to motivate them to uh, learn the systems engineering process. Here's a, an example of a typical review. It consists of a typical systems engineering approach to review, and that is you define the entry criteria. Here are the things you need to go do before you even start preparing for this review. And so we go through, you know, <coughs> all of the things they, they have to do to get to that point in the, in the review. And then we tell them in advance, we publish the evaluation criteria. It's the grading rubric, but it's called an evaluation criteria, <coughs> is listed there. And then, uh, and they get graded on it. And if they, uh, if, they <coughs> if they pass the review, if they get an acceptable score, they get to go on. If they don't, they come back and do it again. 
Okay. <clears throat> and so that's kind of how the basic concept works. Um, this, is, uh, this is what it really looks like. So it may not look like what some of you are think. think. Uh, you probably would identify that as a review of plans, and that's exactly what it is. But uh, this is uh, this is where we how we do our system integration review. It focuses on okay, you're going to take all of this stuff and you're going to put it in the air vehicle. We we want to know what you're putting, where, precisely, why, who's going to do it, and I want to see your ins installation instructions. Because the criteria, the, the criteria is when you pass a systems integration review, you're ready to go put, start putting it together. So it's not like, oh, okay, now I passed, now I'm going to figure out how to do it. So they have to do all of their upfront planning first, and then they uh, they learn that Mother Nature <coughs> very often does not uh, cooperate, and uh, and so they get scars. Now, Mr. Miles talked about uh, <coughs> uh, you know systems engineering. Uh, <clears throat> you, need, you need to have some scars in your back to call yourself a systems engineering. So part of our, actually part of our presentation to ASD r &E is if you structure a design course where the students make all their own decisions, you can give them advice and counsel, but if they screw up, they screw up. And so as an instructor, my job is to make sure that if they are going to screw up, it happens early enough that they can still recover and still meet all of the learning objectives. So the kind of the concept is use a design course as an environment in which students are allowed to fail. As a consequence of fail, they learn some lessons they would not otherwise learn, and it's cheaper in the long run for the people that employ them. So anyway, here's the uh, here's our lessons learned. Requirements, piece of cake. Teaching students about requirements, how to track them, how to manage them, how to demonstrate compliance is a piece of cake. Uh, they have almost 300 requirements they have to <coughs> keep track of across the two semesters, and it's they do it in a spreadsheet, and it's uh, it's relatively straightforward. And, and they, uh, <coughs> the requirements are uh, requirements have to be assigned not by organization but by name. Who is the person responsible for that requirement? What is it <coughs> they're going to do to demonstrate compliance with that requirement? And where's the proof they did? And it's a spreadsheet, and it's, uh, and, and it's graded, and it's responsible for a portion of their semester grade. So they learn requirements really well. <coughs> uh, margins, that's pretty straightforward. Concepts of operation, first time the students deal with designing a mission, uh, it's not very sophisticated and sometimes not very real realistic. And so the whole structure is set up, so we want to get them in the air early in the second semester so they start flying a relatively <clears throat> Again, it's a rail control airplane with all of the equipment. Start learning about why it is their original CONOPS doesn't work. Mother Nature doesn't like airplanes that turn square corners, for example. <clears throat> and so uh, that works relatively well. Measures of effectiveness, another piece of cake. It says, here's how we're going to evaluate your, your, <clears throat> your, your, your design to measure effectiveness. And it's got, it got built into it as things like propulsion cost, vehicle weight, a bunch of other metrics into a, s a simple scoring metric. And um, they understand that real well. They can figure out you know, th what their strategy is. So we've got to reduce this, reduce this, maximize that. And so uh, <coughs> measure of effectiveness, piece of cake. Trade studies are a challenge for them. But <coughs> they're only a challenge if they don't have, have uh, take a model-based approach. So that's, you know, we, in order for our students to be able to do a, a, a correct trade study, they need to have a model of the system. And so this kind of model-based design and trade studies go together. Trying to do trade studies qu just qualitatively does not, in my opinion, teach what students need to know about trade studies. Decision making. No. So you <coughs> all right, so uh, decision making. The challenge with decision making is requiring the students demonstrate the discipline to document their decisions and the rationale while they're making them. If they can, once they crack that code, they're, they're doing pretty well. But generally what students like to do is they like to make decisions. They, we're going to make a team decision. And then you know a few days later, nobody can remember what the decision was or all they remember it differently. So that's, that's a bit of a challenge, but it can be done. Uh, risk, 
Uh, risk is one of those subjects where you really have to get bitten in a, in a, in a sensitive spot in order to understand the true concept of risk. Um, <clears throat> and so the students talk about risk in the first semester and then they, they, <clears throat> they can they not only talk about risk the second semester, they can show you their scars. And that's, that's really, they do understand learning how to do risk. Uh, all of those reviews that they have to go through, you realize when learning is taking place when you see the students doing their own reviews. And they recognize how important it is. Configuration management, same sort of thing. A configuration that is uncontrolled is impossible to design to. And so we'll, we'll let it unravel a little bit, and then they'll understand why it is important for everybody, for <coughs> making sure that somebody, everybody understands what goes where and why, and there's no, ad, no additional stuff in there. <coughs> so test and evaluation. Real challenge with test and evaluation is the time and effort required to analyze the data. They're good at, they're actually pretty good at planning a test once they learn how to do it. They're good at executing it. Um, and then they want to get on to the next one, and, and it's <coughs> having the discipline to go back through the data, sort it out, find the good data, throw out the 99% that's not, and do analysis on it is a challenge for them. And it's a schedule challenge. Uh, leadership, <coughs> um, it's relatively straightforward. We do peer evaluation, so the second semester grade is based on the student's evaluation of their peers and wh whether or not they're meeting expectations. And so it's not unusual for uh, like the, a team lead to be having an internal design review and, and going like, okay, <coughs> so here's what we need to have done. This needs to get done by this time. And uh, if I get it late, here's what your evaluation is. And if I get it on time and the quality is not there, and so they're establishing their, they're using that criteria to make sure they get quality products on time. Uh, program management, 20, look, 20 person team is tough for students, so it's important to break it up so that it, it focus, so they can focus on products. So typically we have four or five projects going on at the same time, 20 students are manageable sized teams. But uh, <clears throat> I think students learn a lot from being, from having to run their own teams of a large size. Two or three students in a team, they can certainly learn something, but not as much as they have to deal with a larger team. So let me get through with this. So here's, a, here's the experience. It can be done. Um, our concept, and I think the challenge that most of us are going to have in talking to other disciplines is, you want me to teach systems engineering in my design course? What do you want me to not teach? And here's the answer. The answer is, you can teach systems engineering in a capstone design course without displacing any other content if you structure the design course that way. It can be done. <clears throat> I think it's applicable to any design course. I think it's applicable, and, that, and that's an assertion. I don't have any data. And so, John, I'm going to turn in a proposal <clears throat> on how to do that. Um, another assertion can be done with any engineering discipline. Uh, but in order to do that, you have to translate relatively generic systems engineering concepts into something sp discipline specific. And that's why I make my statement. This needs to be led by people from disciplines who understand the in <coughs> systems engineering in their discipline. I think that needs to be done. So we've tested the concept. It works relatively well. I see absolutely no reason why systems engineering should not be taught in every design course. And quite frankly, I think a bit should require it. And as a matter of fact, again, kind of a, an opinion here, in order for us to be successful in this goal, I think ABET is going to have to take a much stronger position on the importance of learning systems engineering than what they do now, which is, oh, uh, yeah, you've got to have a multidisciplinary experience. No, you need to learn something about systems engineering. Okay, thank you very much. John, I. <coughs> My guess is I've taken too long. So, no, so thank you very much. So uh, I've got a question. So sure. you gave them a handout at, uh, at the beginning. So this is kind of the fundamentals of systems engineering. Did they refer back to that, or did they really depend upon having sort of expert instructors to sort of guide them through that process? Well, the basic strategy I take with the students is this is the real world. And so when you go off to your jobs, you're going to be given something to read. And it's not just to flip through it. It's to... And so they're expected to read it and, and, and understand it and then ask questions. 
Um, I'm, I'm not sure so, I answered so your question. Is it critical that you have instructors who have been through systems, in, who are skilled in systems engineering, in order to help them through that process? I think it is. Yeah. I think I think I think the instructors need to understand systems engineering and not talk about it as a theoretical subject, which is a challenge. So questions? Yes. Yeah, uh, my 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 knowledge of, of accreditation is focused solely on aerospace, and aerospace has actually been kind of a vanguard for systems engineering and, and education, and so we have some uh, ABET out, uh, outcomes that talk about things like multidiscipline experience, working with teams, and some other things, and the word systems engineering is not mentioned, and and particularly no no mention of a requirement to have systems engineering content in any coursework, which I think is important. Um, yes. A quick note on that and then my question. When we took, uh, when we at Incosi took systems engineering to ABAP, we met with Firestorm. Mm -hmm. uh, the I'm not surprised. I think I'm describing it. And uh, AIAA was one of the few societies that really welcomed the whole Yeah. But uh, my question is, um, do you have any sense of how many um, what I'll call discipline engineering groups in, in universities are using a capstone course of, of many students on a team like you are versus ones that are still doing capstone courses with one student or maybe two students? Yeah, somebody's raising. Uh, is it? Sure. Yeah. So my, here, my, let me, from from my experience at my own university, um, I have the largest teams. Most of the projects are small number of students, three or four, um, and, and and that's about the, that's about the way they go. And and they don't have much outside of aerospace. Have very little emphasis on systems engineering. Yes. I don't understand them. <coughs> so I, I look at it from my own perspective and I start reading some generic processes in a systems engineering manual and if, if I give that to my students, they just read it and their eyes glaze over. Now, um, you know, since I've, I've been dealing with systems engineering for a long time, I do a, f a better job of translating some of those generic processes into something really required for design. Uh, but there are some of them that I, even I can't understand. Yes. Uh, as an industry perspective, the G, I probably the system sounds like the GE, the way it is. Several of the businesses totally love this concept. They think systems are very critical, uh, as in discipline, but you can't you know, develop it 15 years in. So they're starting with a one week system thinking class for all engineers, like their first year. One thing those businesses, power and water and engines, are distinguishing systems thinking from systems engineering. That's one thing we can think about is what that distinction. Yeah. 
Well, what I think the students need to learn is how to engineer a system. And then in order to engineer a system, you have to know something about systems engineering, but the focus needs to be for the, these students is engineering a system. And so a lot of the, you know, I went through systems engineering a, a week long or a five, two, couple day long thing at uh, General Dynamics and then Lockheed Martin. And most of the students were, or the people who were doing something else during the class and it was not terribly effective. But those that, you know, after they'd been on a big project where they learned they had to function in, in a systems engineering fashion, uh, th they were much more receptive. Well, I'm going to cover some of the growth in my but most of it is case studies. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the business, the people with gray hair, talking about, here's how I see it. I think that's much more Yeah, that's, the, 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 those, those are more useful, certainly, yeah. Any other? Okay. Well, the, the yeah. So the, the the first the first time through uh, requirements, I I try to turn it into a relatively kind of mindless exercise. Of step one is to find them and write them down, and so it's a matter of taking them out of the document, and paste them into a spreadsheet, and then they have to go through and and decide how they're going to how they're going to deal with it. First of all, do they, do they think these are uh, really, really hard requirements that they can push against or, or they can't push against, or are, they, are these requirements that they think they can uh, design to. And so they go through and they do a top level analysis and they go through and then finally they end up with uh, <coughs> having to uh, come up with their product design that meets those requirements. And in order to do that, they, you know, they learn that they have to <coughs> They have to do a lot of studies in order to get all of those requirements to come into balance. So it's it's all it's it, it, when I say it's easy, uh, it's not as difficult as I thought it would be, but it's uh, pretty straightforward. Yes. Well, I think the point is that uh, halfway through the project, you should change the mission. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what the point is. That then they'll really learn <laughs> about. Yeah. Well, let me tell you what the what. Yeah, I understand. I I I, I tried that once, uh, and it was it was pretty chaotic, and and I and had a difficult time achieving learning objectives. But typically, what ha here's what typically happens is there's a requirement in there that they missed, and then they find it, and it's the same thing as having to do that change a requirement. Oh, I didn't real I didn't realize that thing had to fit that thing that you specify. Yes. Yes. How many in this room, raise your hands, please, agree with the phrase that uh, you have to teach discipline specific systems engineering? How many agree with that? I don't, I don't know what, it, what you mean by have to teach. For undergraduates, I think you have to. For, yeah, for, for engineers in that discipline, it has to be translated into their discipline. In healthcare, we frequently, this is a closed system. Meaning you have an airplane, you know what you're designing, right? So in healthcare, we face no, not really. all the time this problem of an open system, where we have to define even what the system is. What are we considering to be the system? Mm -hmm. so you got to define that before you can ever approach the, the, um, the requirements. And right. it's not that easy. It really is. True. Because, um, Yours is more challenging. We approach it as a complex adaptive yeah, our, our systems are, you're, you're right, they're, they're relatively closed, but they're open in that they have to be operated by human beings. Yeah. And so that opens it up. I mean, these are undergraduate students, yeah. and it opens them up enough 
that they realize they have to design for human beings and that opens it up. It's sort of the difference between an embedded system and a cyber physical system, right? Where you put the yeah. networking and now it's part of a, an ecosystem. But, but, you're, but you're right. I just wanted to inject a comment at this point. Um, this last question is really important. Um, you know, one of the things that we can't agree among ourselves. If you look at, it's interesting, if you look at the, you know, the, the Vision 2025, it says systems thinking for all decision, systems decision makers, right? And systems engineering for all engineers. And then, you know, multidisciplinary skills and leadership capabilities for all systems engineers. So there's kind of this, this pyramid, if you will. Systems thinking is the, is the foundation. Yeah. You raised a very good point. When we were talking about the scope within INCOSI of what we should take on, understand. Yeah. We this say is, the issue is that is that everybody, right? Right. right? right. And we said, I know, you know, we'd love to, but I understand. We said if we could actually impact systems, uh, all the engineers educated around the world. Right. Boy, we should feel pretty good about ourselves. That's right. That's right. right. But wouldn't it be nice, though, if you could, if you could interject systems thinking, right? Because the big complex problems, not necessarily, I mean, you don't they necessarily, you know, they require all disciplines, not just engineers. Yeah. I, 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 I agree with you, but from, you know, from the perspective of undergraduate students,